Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday, June 29th, 2021 Cultural Audit Report Workshop of the East Bay Mud Board of Directors. In accordance with the Governor's Executive Order N0821, uh, which suspends portions of the Brown Act, public participation will be via webinar and teleconference only. In compliance with said orders, a physical location will not be provided for this meeting. All directors, including myself, are participating via webinar. Uh, roll call, please, Madam Secretary. Director Coleman. Director Katz. Present. Director McIntosh. Here. Director Mellon. Present. Director Patterson. Director Young. Yep. President Lenny. Here. Uh, all right, this is the time for public comment. If uh, members of the public wish to make a public comment prior to the start of the workshop, uh, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. When prompted, please use your name, uh, state your name, affiliation if applicable, and topic. The secretary will call each speaker in the order received. We have one person, we have two for public comment, and we're going to start with Eric L. Eric, you should be able to unmute your mic, and your three minutes will start now. Good morning. Thank you, Risha. This is Eric Larson, President of AFSCME Local 444. Uh, good morning, directors and general manager. Uh, firstly, I would like to commend uh, the board, the general manager, and the authors of the report at a, on their commitment to uh, uh, racial uh, equity and diversity uh, at the district at East Bay Mud. Uh, East Bay Mud has a uh, history of uh, racism uh, in our uh, company going back many years. Uh, it's a history that uh, few of our uh, current employees are aware of, uh, but uh, ho hopefully through uh, these processes, uh, uh, we'll become uh, more aware of. Uh, and it is a culture that is, um, uh, goes, goes on today, it lives on today uh, through uh, the minimization that is identified by uh, the Winters group of uh, the senior management team, minimization uh, of, uh, systemic racism, uh, both in our society and uh, at uh, the district. I brought up after uh, the affirmative action report some months ago to the board of directors concerned that AFSCME 444 had uh, regarding uh, the fact that uh, in the trades, uh, the underrepresentation of people of color, uh, particularly African-American and women uh, exists today and uh, stand out um, uh, glaringly uh, from uh, the district as a whole. Uh, Risha, I'm sorry, uh, you're coming through. Go, go ahead, go. Eric. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, the concern that uh, uh, in the trades at SD1 of 100 trades workers, there are only five women and only five African Americans. And when a, a assistant shift supervisor was under consideration for promotion, of those 10 individuals, five brought forward complaints of harassment unsafe and unprofessional behavior to uh, the manager of uh, wastewater operations and maintenance who forwarded those uh, complaints to HR recognizing I believe uh, the uh, that the, the, the body of uh, the individuals who were bringing forward the complaints indicated that they're uh, uh, may be a uh, racist or gender biased component of the uh, harassment and unprofessional behavior. 
though none of the individuals personally uh, 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 made uh, specific allegations of uh, racist or gender bias. Um, the promotion was uh, granted to the assistant before the investigation was started, let alone before the investigation was ended. And uh, that was a glaring slap in the face to uh, those individuals who uh, uh, have felt uh, alienated, further alienated, and uh, the actions of that manager further created a hostile work environment for those uh, minorities in the trades at SD1. Again, the five women out of 100 trades workers five African Americans out of 100 trades workers at SD1. And uh, on the water side, I believe that the statistics are much the same, certainly uh, for uh, women. And so when management fails to uh, 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 recognize and take appropriate um, um, action, such as uh, putting a pause on the promotion process, I think that it is a very white male uh, attitude that says that it would be unfair to the individual who's seeking a promotion. I think it's a very white male uh, attitude that thinks that uh, the people bringing forward these complaints uh, might be bringing forward false complaints. People really don't do that, especially people in uh, these minority situations. Um, Eric, your three minutes have concluded. If you could wrap up your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Risha. Thank you, board. Uh, there is a culture of retaliation um, at East Bay Mud, and there is a awareness and exhaustion of uh, minorities, especially Black and uh, Latinx employees. And it's time for the district to move beyond talk to implementation. We don't need more resolutions, we need actions here at the district. Again, I commend the district, the general manager, the board, and the Winters Group uh, at this endeavor. I hope that it is uh, uh, successful and fosters uh, change here at the district to uh, be more inclusive uh, and provide more ra racial um, equity and uh, gender uh, equity here at the district. Thank you for taking the time to take my comments. Uh, thank you for your comments, Eric. <clears throat> uh, General Manager uh, Chan, uh, Eric has brought up uh, a number of things that I'm not uh, completely aware about, aware of, and I'd be interested to uh, to get more information about it to have an understanding of what what exactly he's um, uh, referring to. Can we get? Some yes. Additional information. We, we we can do that and, and provide the board additional updates. All right. We have. We have another speaker? Yes, we we actually have um, three more people for public comment. Give me one moment. And next we have Thomas Kelly. Thomas, I'm you should be able to unmute your mic. Okay. Am I coming through? Yes, and your three minutes will start now. Okay, I'm Thomas Kelly. I am a journeyman operator at SD1. Um, Eric was just talking about a situation regarding a promotion of a guy who I believe is a racist. Um, first of all, let me give respect to the board, to East Bay Mud. And even though East Bay Mud is the best company that I've ever worked for, I've run into the same different type of obstacles. Clifford Chan, I respect your office, the, the, your position. However, when I saw your letter saying that how East Bay Mud was gonna do these things for people of color, I didn't read it because I have lost heart. It's very hard working at a place where it's predominantly white, and people feel free to say certain things that they shouldn't feel free to because they don't understand what goes on being a black person trying to earn a living. 
I worked at East Bay Regional Park District. And when I was there, there were less black rangers than there were of white women. And I'm talking about black, I'm talking about men and women rangers. A white woman came up to me and said, hey, we need more women in, in this uh, environment. And I told her, there are more white women here than there are black men or women. These are some of the things. One of the things that I do suggest, because I have a short time and I don't really know how these things work. I've been through the DIO investigation. I've been through different things with uh, racism. Somebody showing me a video with, and it ended with nigger, 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 nigger. I talked to that person, they apologized. We kind of made it together, but I shouldn't have had to gone through that. But one of the things that need to happen at SD1 and I hope that will happen is that there be a tr uh, interactive training for supervisors, managers regarding systemic racism in America and what black people have to go through in order to get jobs and to sustain them. There also needs to be training on how to file a complaint if you are uh, someone who's been harassed because of your color or because of your gender. There needs to be, um, the reason why I said that also that it needs to be an interactive training is because there are trainings that I've actually witnessed people go to, but it's not systemic, but just safety trainings and stuff like that as an East Bay Mud employee, where people just let the video play and they walk out because you don't have responses. So people don't necessarily hear stuff, but there's a lot of white people who really do not understand what it takes, the shortcuts that we don't know of. And as soon as black people find out the games, the rules to the game changes. Mm -hmm. I know I may not be speaking a perfectly balanced, well-sentenced, well-English um, way of getting across this message. But if we had those kind of trainings on how to actually do this, not only would it make people think twice who would use the lack of understanding how to do these things, it would send them a message. Second, with these trainings, they would actually get to see some things. There's lots of tools out there. You could go to YouTube and, and just put in systemic racism, veggie tales. And it really lines out things about how white people have an advantage and how much of a disadvantage black people have. I did not understand until later, until I got into my 50s. It's also very scary to bring forth accusations, especially when it's going to say, oh, no, there wasn't enough proof. No, there wasn't enough proof. No, there wasn't enough proof. And then you're kind of red flagged to somebody who goes around starting trouble. Like I said before, East Bay Mud has been the best by far company that I've ever worked for, but there's still shortcomings and I've witnessed them firsthand. And it's kind of like a rape victim. You know how a woman gets raped by like a fraternity or something. And then they have to prove that they were raped and when it, they go through the trial or whatever the different things they have to go through, then they get harassed when it's not proven that this has happened. Then there's retaliation. And you don't want to bring about, bring any complaints against retaliation because you have to go through it again. I have cried. I have gotten angry. I've had black people say stuff like, hey man, you know, you, you gotta be careful. And all I want to do, you guys, as the East Bay Mud employee, I want to learn to do my job the best I can. I want to go to work, and then I want to go home. I want to go home safely. I want to hold my head up proud to be an American. I don't like to hear the word East Bay Mud. We are family. Because some people use that as a way to harass you and to make sure that you don't say certain things.
Thomas, you are three goes. minutes concluded. So if you could wrap up your comments. I hope that I got through and I hope that there will be some changes. I hope that there will be interactive trainings with our supervisors and managers about systemic racism. East Bay Mud has it going on. I'm sorry to tarnish the name, but it's actually happening. And I don't want to come here and do this. This is hard for me. God bless. No, Mr. Kelly, thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate it. Uh, I can tell you it's very, very moving and very appropriate for uh, our discussion today. Thank you for, for coming forward. Okay. Next, we have one moment. Next, we have Yvette Rivera. Yvette, you should be able to unmute your mic. Thank you, Risha. And your three uh, minutes will start now. Uh -oh. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I just want to say, I, I want to thank Eric Larson and Thomas Kelly for speaking this morning, speaking the truth. I spoke at the last week's board meeting about Ariel Bland and Saji Pierce's civil rights lawsuit against the district for retaliation, discrimination, and a hostile work environment, wrongful termination, and everything that they had to deal with from working at the district. Theirs is not the only lawsuit that has come to the district over these years. And last week when I spoke, I said that I stood proudly with Saji Pierce and Ariel Bland. But I want to say that I, I stand proudly with Eric Larson and Thomas Kelly and, and all the people that filed, all of the black men that filed the major Stanley McIntosh and Frank Irvin civil rights lawsuit against East Bay Mud in the 80s. There are so many more lawsuits that I've been able to uncover through Public Records Act requests against East Bay Mud. And I hope the board seriously takes this incredible survey that was created by the winners group and does something with it. I do appreciate that it took the board, at least two members of the board, um, to bring uh, this report to fruition. And again, I, I, I'm really moved and blown away by what Eric Larson and what Thomas Kelly had to say this morning, because I've spoken to so many people at the district that are afraid to come forward I once spoke to a woman, a black woman, who I asked if she wanted to file with me the civil rights complaint against the district that was recently settled. And she stuck out her arm and pointed to her skin and said, Yvette, I've been black for a long time. I know what's gonna happen to me at East Bay Mud if I come forward. <sighs> Again, I hope that the winner's report is taken seriously. They're obviously well known. I researched them before I came on today. And um, I just want to add that, you know, I, I looked at the memo that um, the HR manager put out for the board today. And, you know, it was referenced that there was little representation from Asian men and white males and uh, members of the LB uh, G community or GT community, I forget. Um, but Yvette, I think- report, Your three minutes are up, please, please wrap up if you can. I believe the report says clearly that Asian men didn't wanna participate and that 14 Asian women did. 
I just want to I just want to end this by saying if there's going to be any do over for this report, it should go out. It should be a do over for women and people of color and unrepresented minorities throughout the district. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Joey Smith. Joey, you should be able to unmute your mic. And your three minutes will start now. Joey, we can't hear you. Your mic is unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, there you go. Yes. Now, can you hear me? Yes. All right, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Risha. Good morning to President Lenny, to the board, to General Manager Chan, to all staff, and to our representatives from the winners group. My name is Joey Smith. I started my employment at East Bay Mud in 1992 as a member of the Special Employment Program. One of the few black females who successfully completed and got employed at East Bay Mud, but it was not a cakewalk. I had challenges all the way along the way. I started off after that in the plumber series more serious challenges. I don't need to beat the horse that has been brought out there to you all and is you know, bleeding profusely because everything that the three before me have said is absolutely true. I have witnessed many of it and managed somehow or another to still stick around this long. Those of us who have experienced that are survivors we have purpose in being at East Bay Mud. I tell many people, I don't come here to make friends. If I happen to make some friends, it's a bonus. I'm here like anybody else to make sure that I take care of my family and my financial obligations. But it's always a good thing, a very nice thing, when you can enjoy your choice of employment, when you have opportunities at that choice of employment and manage to get along with the people who are there. I have had some very good people in my experience at East Bay Mud, some of them who gave me a hard time, others who did not get in the way. Now, mind you, I'm not saying that they gave me any favor, handout. they didn't get in my way because there were plenty of people who did. And I thank those people who did not get in my way and gave me a shot. For a long time, I was the only black female who was a plumber at East Bay Mud. I was the only black female who was on the foreman list. Why was that? We weren't able to reach out to people. I became a supervisor. I made it my business to encourage all of my staff to aspire promotion and lifetime learning. And many did promote inside the work group and of the Mud job class. I also had the opportunity to hire people of many ethnicities, religions, ages, et cetera. And so many of them have been successful here at East Bay Mud and some have now retired. I'm now in a position where I am the president of Local 2019. I have one of the most diverse executive boards that I have seen in many union locals, and we all work very diligently to ensure that there is equity for all of our district employees, not just for 2019. We're one of the ones that absolutely must work with all of the locals and those who are not represented as well, the classified. I am very, very pleased and proud to call East Bay Mud the place where I grew up and have successfully had three careers in one workplace, but it has not been without some scars that have needed to heal. This process is helping the healing, but we have to make sure we do it right. And the whole idea of not 
offering promotions to inside employees with the effort of diversity is not the best way, in our opinion, to go about it. Because if you don't have the people who are in here promoting and understanding the purpose and the values of the district, then you, you have to start from scratch each time. Joey, your three minutes Those have concluded. Who, if you can wrap up your comments, please. Those, thank you, Reach. Those of us who are here are here because we want to be here. I have a love for East Bay Mud, and I'm very, very dedicated to doing my part to ensure that every time I get an opportunity to do outreach to people, to know about East Bay Mud, to have the opportunity that I had. I learned about it in a photography class at Laney, the SEP program. That was where I got my start. And I do everything I can to represent to the best that I can. Because while I'm out in the community, I'm known as the East Bay Mud Lady and have been ever since the 90s. Because the children who I saw at the schools during career days, the high schoolers, the people in community colleges, they see me and they think that there's more of me here than they are. I want to make what they think a reality. And we can do this through this effort. Thank you for my time. Thank you, Joey. <clears throat> okay, next we have Casey Evans. Casey, you should be able to unmute your mic. And your three minutes will start now. Thank you very much, Risha. Good morning, all. Dairy board members, TM, good morning. Thank you all for your time. So I do want to thank you all for taking an interest in this subject and for taking an interest in doing something at the district. Um, but I, 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 so I do. I think, I said it the last time, I think that sometimes the message gets muddled when it gets up to the top. So, you know, I do just want to kind of come to you from the bottom and Clifford, I just say, I just, I, I'm not close enough for lunch. We've been on, on time apart, but I, I know I could bring this to you directly. <laughs> okay, so, but it takes the team to make the dream work. So, you know, I just want to say, you know, many of you know me, you know, but I, I, I must say after I spoke to you last week, I'm still waiting on the retaliation and hiding in my home. So I, I'm, I'm nervous every time I have to speak to you, but I do have to, come up and say it because it is true. And so th there definitely is a, a, a culture of retaliation. So if y'all start seeing me in the office, you know what happens. Um, you know, I love the district and I'm gonna be here till June 1st, 2037. So, I mean, I'm not going nowhere till they kick me out, but I am here to tell you what happens at the bottom. I mean, even you as board members, I mean, I don't think you understand in our previous system, we had your districts numbered based on what order we were gonna go out to them based on field calls because we know who's where. And these are things that you guys would never even know because you'll never see the account number. You'll never come down into the dungeon to come speak to those who speak because they're only gonna bring me the ones that are pretty. So, you know, I do wanna say as staff, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an employee who was told and gratefully so, gratefully so. But when I came to the district, I had a natural. I had to straighten my hair to get on permanent. And I'm glad that I was lit in on how it works. And I wear it straight to this day. But that is the kind of thing that happens here at the district. It's not necessarily it's a secret. It's just at the bottom. But it does affect you even up to the top. You know, as a union member, I've seen horrific things. I've been in horrific meetings that I'm not even going to speak on. But there, there's been things that I think that we do have the opportunity to fix and we could fix. But we have to be serious about fixing it and not just do the lipstick on a pig model. You know, I mean, even in this current negotiations, I mean, there's been things slipped across the table that have a tinge to it that it's like, and I know that no one can see it. Believe me, I understand that it's not uh, purposeful or malicious. But, you know, I, I think that if you want to fix the problem, I would just, you know, I love the board because you guys have no problem asking questions. So I just will say, you know, ask your questions, get it, get the proof. Okay. Because it's, it's important. And 
with the pension system and everything I want to have a new family here. Because everybody I know when I came in is all leaving and they're all retiring out. And I don't know if many people are going to be staying for that kind of time. So I'm hoping to keep some with me till June 1st, 2037. Any of you that want to stay, feel free to stay. And I thank you for your time. But I do encourage you to listen. Thank you, Casey. We have one more speaker. It's W. Ibarra. I believe that's Wendy. And Wendy, you should be able to unmute your mic. Is that Wendy? Thank you. Yes, Risha. It is Wendy Ibarra, local okay. 20. Great. I'm going to start your time now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, board. Good morning, um, general manager and staff. Um, the reason why I'm speaking out is because um, it, at the district, there's some serious issues and they start with the recruitment process. The recruitment process, the HR process, it all needs to be revamped. When a district as big as the one we have does not appreciate and acknowledge and reward those that know how to, that knows the district, those that knows how to do the job based on their knowledge, but rather based on the games that are played by certain folks that are higher up, based on the um, the ways that, that the civil service rules are misinterpreted. There is a problem with that. There is a problem when you are giving um, more priority or um, you are benefiting those that come from outside the district based on the friendships that they may have and you stop the, the progress of your workforce because you don't like their ethnicity, because you don't like who they are, for whatever reason, there is a problem. There is a problem when you, when, when there is one person who single-handedly changes the, the rules of the civil service for promotions based on their personal interpretation of the rule. There's a problem when they feel that they that because our headquarters is based in a certain neighborhood, that it's okay to have certain groups or certain departments be absolutely 100% represented by that area. That's unfair. Our workforce should be as diverse as our entire um service area, if not more like our entire state. There is a problem when we, instead of appreciating and working with the unions, we are at times made to seem that we are creating problems when all we want is equity for our members. There is a problem when we have a DIO program department that does not see the problems for what they are. And instead, we start to create different situations that are not there. There's a problem when upper management, no matter how high it is, they don't have a direct conversation or direct contact with the folks that are doing the job because people tend to pretty the reports. People tend to know exactly what others want to hear and they will base their reports on that. So I urge you to really take a look at the entire process of promotion, the entire process of human resources to make sure that we are valuing those that are on the front lines, that we value to everyone and what everyone brings to the table. Thank you. Thank you. President Lenny, we have one additional speaker for public comment. That is George Cleveland. George, you should be able to unmute your mic. And your three you. minutes will start now. Thank you, Risha. Good morning, members of the board, President Linney, General Manager Chan, and anyone else on the call. Um, I'm hearing these stories and shaking me up a bit. 
but I want to relay something that happened a couple of years ago and I hope never happens again at East Bay Mud. There was a situation in which a supervisor uh, repeatedly used N-word, made disparaging remarks about Latinos, specifically people of Mexican descent. A claim was filed through DIO. The charges and allegations were all substantiated and yet the individual who made those comments was not fired, but was allowed to resign. And I found that appalling because the comments were directed towards my local 2019 members. And I found it that the idea is when you further you up, go up the chain of command in this company, the better the behavior is supposed to be and the consequences should be more severe if the type of behavior is displayed. And I know full well that if my members had engaged in that same conduct, that they would have been terminated immediately. We would have gone through the process, of course, but they would have been let go. And the idea that someone in a position of authority was allowed to stay on the job and resign is appalling, awful. That should never happen ever again at this company because we are better than that. So I just want to put that out there and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, George. <clears throat> okay. Marisha, do we have anyone else? We have no um, more speakers for public comment. Uh, <clears throat> all right, I just want to comment before um, Clifford kicks off our, uh, our, our program here. Uh, I do appreciate, I think we all appreciate uh, the comments uh, that were made this morning. Uh, I'm sure they were hard. Uh, it's always hard in the, the face of what looks like a lot of authority anyway, <clears throat> to, to be honest and, and give uh, uh, your, uh, your comments and things that you think that we should hear. And I appreciate that greatly. And I think it's uh, certainly fully appropriate for uh, setting the table a little bit this morning in our, our program. Uh, so with that, Clifford, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, President Lenny, and uh, good morning, board members. Um, uh, welcome to our um, cultural audit report workshop. I also want to just comment that I also appreciate all the um, speakers who um, commented today. Um, I, what I hear is their passion for East Bay and Mud, but I also hear uh, and really appreciate them highlighting the issues and challenges that we face, um, which really explains why we're doing what we're doing today and why we're having so many difficult conversations and had so many difficult conversations um, since we began this. Um, today, we have two items to present to you. The first is an update on our racial equity and justice project uh, and our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. Um, we'll share with you our progress on the strategies identified um, in the REG project, um, as well as the work on the five pilot projects um, that many staff have been working on, um, and also the timeline to complete the draft diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. Um, the second item is a follow-up to the cultural audit report presentation by the winners group um, at the April 8th board meeting. The board requested additional time to review the report and to have this workshop to continue the discussion um, from April 8th. Um, there were some elements missing from the first draft that we uh, mentioned in the memo um, that weren't in the report that we're addressing now, um, which will be included in the DEI strategic plan. Um, we'll start by addressing some of the questions and comments that we received from the board, um, and then we'll take the remaining time on the second item for an open discussion. Um, so with that introduction, Derry Moten, our Manager of Employee and Organizational Development, uh, will lead the discussion. Uh, good morning, board members. We're going to um, proceed with our update on racial equity and justice. Um, uh, to begin with, we are uh, kind of going to cover a few specific things. Um, we're going to give you over the overall view of the Racial Equity and Justice Project. Okay, all right. Excuse me just a moment. Just one moment. Okay, 
So we're going to give you an overview of the Racial Equity and Justice Project and the Diversity Inclusion uh, Strategic Plan development, and we'll provide you with the next steps. And as uh, as uh, as a general manager Chan mentioned, we'll then go into the work to specifically uh, to answer questions uh, from the board has regarding the winter's report. So to begin with, we are. Uh, working on all of the strategies that the board uh, had listed in our original uh, uh, resolution. And in that resolution, uh, strategy one was, again, listening to the voices of black and African-Americans. Uh, what we've been doing with this particular strategy is we've been continuing to do work with all of our affinity groups, um, specifically uh, the lead group that we had started working with is the Black Employee Network, and then that's been extended to work with um, each of our other affinity groups as well. Our big goals have been how to continue to strengthen resilience and enhance uh, overall wellness uh, with, with employees. And so we've uh, been doing uh, listening sessions with e each of the groups. Uh, we've also done training with each, each of the affinity group leadership teams to actually uh, equip them with uh, some training specifically on on how they can exercise listening within their, their group specifically. We've launched uh, in partnership with Claremont EAP some strengthening resilience and enhancing wellness sessions, which have been specifically designed to uh, provide a platform for people to talk about um, uh, a lot of the, the stress-related issues uh, that are coming up. And as, again, if you heard specifically from people that provided comment this morning, uh, those issues are issues that we do want people to bring specifically into these opportunities to have more dis uh, discussion in addition to be able to use our, our uh, diversity, um, excuse me, our affirmative action and e e EAP, excuse me, our DIO programs. Uh, also, we're working on strategies for ongoing listening, and this will look like a, our uh, a development of our ongoing survey work uh, to, again, continue to capture the pulse uh, of, of what's going on within the district. We're working with a couple of vendors right now specifically to uh, create an RFP, specifically to give us um, uh, some bandwidth to be able to work on having a uh, strategy for listing going forward. For strategy two, which is identifying issues and devising solutions to the impacts of prejudice, uh, again, what we've been doing is doing reviews of the cultural audit to look at kind of deeper analysis from what uh, Winters has provided to identify some really specific strategic actions that will be part of our strategic plan and also to respond specifically to voices, uh, information that we're hearing within our listening sessions. Um, secondary thing is, as has been mentioned, because they're, um, uh, the focus groups uh, that Winters provided, uh, we did not have adequate uh, representation from our LGBTQIA plus uh, community, Asian males and white males. And the reason it's important to also get all of these voices is that we, we, want, the, we want the report to actually reflect fully the culture and the, and, the, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the atmosphere of the district. So it's important for us to add those, um, those focus groups to make sure that we have adequate data and that that data then becomes part of our overall strategic planning process. Strategy three is reviewing the district processes and practices. We've had the core team and senior management team uh, doing data analysis and work on community engagement as part of their pilot projects. Um, and our community, community engagement process, what we've been doing is trying to identify the best ways to activate uh, racial equity toolkit, specifically a series of questions that we want to ask ourselves when we're looking at any particular issue or project that needs to happen. In reviewing our district policies and practices, what we'll also be doing is actually trying to create a specific uh, racial equity toolkit uh, that's customized to review our policies and procedures. So we'll be looking at how we can integ integrate that into our work. And then the key processes, which have, again, been mentioned today, our hiring processes, our promotion processes are in review as part of the pilot projects that we're working on. With strategy four, reviewing and enhancing district policies and procedures to identify and address any systemic biases. Again, staff are reviewing uh, the seven policies that the Winters Group did review as part of, of the cultural audit. In addition, you'll hear about a little bit later, the Winters Group is actually also going to provide some analysis of our civil service rules as part of this process as well. 
um, staff, but then also developing a strategic approach and model for ongoing review of district policies and procedures. And as I mentioned, that is a customization of our racial equity tool that we're using in our pilot projects, but looking at those tools specifically to ask questions of, of our policies and procedures as those uh, will be improved on an ongoing basis. In strategy five, we're building a culture of inclusion through organizational cultural competence and emotional intelligence. We're in the process of doing instructional design for um, a, a, a development of a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion maturity model and identifying any nece necessary leadership competencies. And so we're looking specifically at how we continue to take our existing emotional intelligence program, expand that to more staff within the organization, and integrate that emotional intelligence com uh, content to also include how we add cultural competence to uh, one of the elements that people need in order to, to, to move forward. One of the issues that is very significant in any case where we have um, acts of racism is that we we'll also will parallel finding low levels of emotional intelligence in people that are either triggered by things or are operating uh, in, in, in ways that are not acceptable in terms of behavior. So one of the methods to address that is to make sure that people have training specifically on emotional intelligence and they connect that emotional intelligence to their own cultural competence. So the combining of those two is one of the core elements that we'll be looking at as we're moving forward with our training process. In strategy six, we're establishing protocols for responding to racism targeted at district employees. Our response team was uh, put together. Uh, they have responded to uh, an initial incident that was identified. Uh, within the process, the team identified opportunities to continue to refine the process and to update our procedures, uh, specifically procedure 227, which is our equal employment opportunity, discrimination, harassment, and retaliation complaints, investigation and appeals uh, procedure. So that procedure is under review right now. Um, we're looking at how we update it with scenarios that, that contain methods for uh, what is not currently there, and that is how we deal with uh, customers, how we deal with um, other organizations or contractors um, when it comes to uh, having to file EEO claims. Um, so that will be integrated into uh, this procedure as we're working moving forward with this. So what we're doing overall to kind of build this together is our, our, our building of our of diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan is really building on three specific uh, elements here. First is our existing DEI efforts, which include our existing affirmative action plan, our existing internships, affinity groups, our diversity committee, our racial equity and justice projects and strategies, and our managers and supervisors training and our values project. While we are, are building from these, we're also looking at how do we continue to challenge those processes uh, to build more efficiencies and to be more, uh, more focused on racial equity specifically. When it comes to the next element here is our internal audit, which the Winters Group has, been wor has worked with us on. Um, and again, they have the five elements that are integrated into that uh, report, which is again our key stakeholder interviews our employee focus groups, and again, we mentioned some enhancements we'll be doing with those focus groups, our inclusion insight survey that we completed, and that survey uh, had roughly um, a little over 50% of the employees of the district responded to that survey, our intercultural developmental inventory, which is given specifically to managers uh, and the management team, and then the review of our existing HR data, uh, which was all part of the cultural audit. And then finally, we have our pilot projects, what we're doing with uh, winter subcontractor OG Racial Equity. And those pilot projects are all focused on implementation of racial equity processes to look deeply at five specific areas. Number one, our capital infrastructure investments, our overall community engagement, our contract and procurement processes, hiring and recruitment, and promotion and retention. It's the integration of these uh, elements that all will get to uh, the point of our strategic plan development. And so within the strategic plan, um, again, we're being starting to draft the initial elements of that plan, again, with the uh, creation of a, a district vision for DEI, um, a, a specific diversity, equity, and inclusion policy for the district, and then framing uh, a framework for implementation of, of the pilot projects and the work that will come from those as we're moving forward. So the strategic plan, we're looking at, at five specific areas of focus when we look at our full strategic plan. And that is number one, addressing our compliance issues. And that is um, the updating of our uh, 
uh, DIO office procedures, uh, complaint procedures, making sure that those are in line with, with, uh, with our legal compliance, but are also go beyond legal compliance and actually get us to the point where we're, um, we have options <clears throat> for issues that do not rise to the level of formal complaints. And that is uh, specific things that we would need to do in order to have alternative dispute resolution and other types of, of avenues that are available to us. Number two is cultural, culture and awareness, is dealing with our overall uh, work culture and building awareness of, of uh, the need for diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout the district. Third is our HR practices, which we talked about with our pilot projects that are focused on hiring and on promotion. Uh, also within that is our practices around training and other elements. Then the final two are operations integration, which looks at, again, how our managers and supervisors integrate uh, inclusion principles and practices into their work, um, how we build diversity in work groups. And then finally, our community integration, which looks at how we, um, how we look outwardly. And then we're working with this with another pilot project, which is specifically focused on looking at our contracts uh, and our procurement processes, looking at our capital improvement projects, and our overall community engagement. So the Winters contract, we have been working with them and we're making what we refer to as a, as a pivot. And that pivot is we've been working on our five pilot projects, but we're going to shift our consulting time with the Winters Group and ONG Racial Equity to focus on four key things. Our pilot projects will continue to move forward, but we'll we use our time working with Winters uh, specifically to do a few things. Number one is uh, have a pilot project work review, which will uh, we're providing uh, data from uh, from our teams. We just had a meeting with our core team, and each of the five project teams provided updates on where they are with their projects. We'll be uh, packaging that information and providing it to ONG, and ONG will do a review with Winters Group, and we will again have some feedback and look at, at areas we want to uh, continue to move forward and where we want to make some adjustments. Number two is development of a focus group protocol. And that focus group protocol is for the process of community engagement, which is a step that each of our work groups will be, our pilot projects rather, will be doing as we're going forward. Next is the review of the civil service rules, which I, I referenced previously in terms of procedures. And then five is strategic planning support. And this is working with Winters uh, specifically to have some com deeper conversations on um, the recommendations that were made and how those can be drafted into our final strategic plan process. And again, our project schedule, I won't, I won't take too much time with this, but really may, most significant thing I want to call uh, everyone's eyes to is our diversity inclusion strategic plan, the very last item there. Our target is to have that completed by the end of August, which would uh, be ready for the September board meeting for your, your review. So again, each of the teams are working on specific projects. We'll be pulling data from those projects, which will uh, inform the strategic plan. As I mentioned, the other elements that are all part of that, uh, our study from the women in the trades and other work that's been done around the district in terms of racial equity and justice. So our next steps are, again, we'll continue with our implementation and recommendations for all phases uh, and the two strategies um, that we uh, initially began with, the strategy one, six, seven, and eight. We'll continue the development of the work plans for the uh, phase three strategies. These four strategies, strategy two, three, four, and five, are intertwined with the work that we're doing with Winters and with ONG. And then we'll continue the core team work on racial equity pilot projects. And finally, we'll be working on the development, uh, excuse me, the strategy planning sessions that we'll be working with with the Winters group. So at this point, what we're going to do is make a transition. If there are no questions regarding this information, we do want to open up uh, for uh, the Q&A for Winters. And so what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to stop my share and we will <clears throat> uh, begin with the process of... Derek? Uh, yes. Uh, maybe before we jump straight into the winners group, let's see if the board does have any questions about your section. Question. Lisa, did you have a question? No, no questions. Okay. Okay. I don't see any hands. Thank you, Derry. Okay. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So we compiled uh, questions that the board had, had uh, provided, and what we're going to do now is actually turn this over to the Winters Group to actually address those questions. And um, uh, from the Winters Group, we, hear, we have um, uh, their principal, uh, Mary Frances Winters, is here. We have um, uh, Marisha Reese, Thamara Submarian, and from ONG Racial Equity is Ray, Ariel, Ariel uh, Guerrero. So I'm going to turn this over to, uh, I believe, to Marisha to start with the Q&A. Thank you, Gary. I'm actually going to turn it over to Mary Frances. She wanted to say a few things, and then Thamara will get going with the questions. Yeah, very simply, in the essence of time, I just wanted to um, share with the board that we continue um, to um, be excited about working with you all. Um, it was... Um, wonderful he to hear some of the voices today because sometimes when you just hear the see the statistics and the data, uh, putting voice to that data um, can be um, extremely important. So I thought that that was a really important um, session. And we are happy to continue to work with you um, as you, you, you've made a lot of progress um, and you continue to make progress. We always say that this is a journey, um, that it takes time, um, but we also um, don't want people to use time as an excuse. And it doesn't look like you're doing that. You're moving, you're moving right along. So. Uh, that is really um, great to hear. We understand that you had some additional questions um, that we are um, we are prepared to answer today. And Thamra Subramanian, um, who is the manager of um, equity and our strategy um, audits, is go going to um, going to share with you and answer some of those questions. Thank you, Mary Frances. So I'm just going to go question by question with the questions that you all gave us. And thank you so much for them. Um, it was really helpful and great to see how much insight and um, efforts that you are putting towards really implementing this cultural audit work. So first, um, I know a lot of you, I'm just going to go question by question. So um, a lot of you had asked about some more background on the minimization developmental orientation of the IDI and what it means. I'm going to actually pass it back to Mary Frances to give you a little bit more on what that means and what that means for you. Um, <laughs> as a board member. I request that you not, please do not use acronyms. Please say what the letters mean for those of us that are not steeped in this field. Thank you. Sure, I'm um, sorry about that. So the IDI is the Intercultural Development Inventory um, and a lot of you had asked questions about that. So I will pass it to Mary Frances to um, answer that for you all. Um, Thamra, would you just really um, sh share the question the exact, the exact question again? Yes, so the question was, um, could you provide a little bit more background on the development ori developmental orientation of minimization and what that means? The Intercultural Development Inventory um, is a psychometric tool that was developed probably about 50 years ago by two um, academicians, Dr. Milton Bennett and um, Dr. Mitch Hammer. Dr. Mitch Hammer um, now owns the tool. And the theory, it's a theory-based tool, and the theory behind the tool is that we either see the world uh, from a monocultural perspective, I only see the world from my worldview, or we see the world from an intercultural perspective, that we have enough experience across difference that we are able to unpack and understand those differences that make a difference. There are five orientations along the continuum, and the first, orient, the first two orientations are the monocultural worldview. I only see the world from, my only, from only mine. At denial, one would just basically say, I don't you know, I don't know anything about differences because that's the very first stage where someone has not had any experience across difference. And so um, they ignore it, di the difference, they're disinterested in differences. They might say, you know, what, what race problem? Um, as you move and develop, it's a developmental model, as you develop to the next phase, which is polarization, at polarization, um, it is just that. You see the world as us and them. Again, it's a very simplistic way of thinking about difference and you only see the world from your own perspective. So it would be like, why do those, why do those people do that? That's, that's, really, that's really horrible because you're looking at it from your lens um, and, and you're only seeing it, this in a very simplistic way. The third place along the continuum, which is, which is what you were asking about, is minimization. And so now I've developed to a point where I'm saying, you know, it's not an us and them world. It really is just about us because we're all human after all. 
we're all the same. And so you tend to overemphasize similarities. You tend to, um, you tend to see those similarities, which, are, which is a great thing, but you also don't see, also at minimization, tend not to see the differences. You minimize those differences. You might say, I don't see color. Um, it's not important to me. I just treat everybody um, the same. Based on some of the stories that we heard um, this morning, um, I saw both, I heard both minim, I've heard both polarization and minimization. So someone who would um, make explicit um, racist remarks like using, using the N word, that would be, you know, us and them. And I don't like you because you're not, you know, you're, you're different from us. Uh, minimization would be where you have policies and practices that don't work uh, for different groups that they 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 were developed perhaps um, to work for a workforce that um, you know 50 years ago and but but minimization would be the assumption that that everything um, every everything that we would develop would work for everyone so the issue with minimization and and moving along the continuum when you get to acceptance adaptation which are the two intercultural places where you can see the world vis-a-vis -vis others. Um, at that stage, you recognize differences that make a difference. So when you're developing policies and practices, you would say, huh, does this work for everyone? Let me think about the experiences of our African-American employees. Let me think about our experiences of our Asian employees, our women employees. And um, are, are, we, are we continuing to cause um, harm that we saw in the, uh, in, the, um, the, um, in the surveys that we did, in the audit that we did? And so someone at, at acceptance adaptation has enough experience across difference. Um, Derry talked about um, empathy and intercultural competence. And so um, the combination of those two would be someone who's at acceptance adaptation. Most people who take this tool fall at minimization because we've taught people to minimize differences. We've taught people not to see those differences. We've taught people to just treat everybody the same. And so the challenge for you all in the future is going to be to break out of that minimization by having more knowledge, more education, more training, so that you can ask those questions. Being culturally competent doesn't mean that you know everything there is to know about other people's cultures. It means that you have a curiosity mindset so that you're going to ask the, the question and not assume that everybody is the same. So that's a long answer, uh, but I hope that that has, been, um, that has been helpful and I'm happy to clarify. I tried not to be too, um, to academic on it. Great, thank you so much, Mary Francis. That was incredibly helpful. I also wanted to add to that, um, when you all are currently working on your racial equity strategies and moving forward with the process with the ONG and the Winters Group, something we want to also look at in those processes is how our minimization orientation may show up and how you create strategies and think about strategies. Um, so that is something to think about as well. Perhaps what are some ways to better improve how we are holding people accountable? Um, so thank you so much. All right. So the next question we have is, do we have data on who does the hiring? Example given our POC, people of color involved in the hiring process. This is a question we don't have the answer to as we don't work directly inside of East Bay, but we are assuming that the HR team would have the racial ethnic composition or demographic information of those specifically in the HR team. In our report, we do have the demographic information of East Bay um, as a whole in the appendix. Did we speak with retirees? And if not, um, will well, we? Hang, hang on, uh, Tamara. I understand you, you guys don't have the answer, but you just um, sort of bounced it to uh, HR, uh, Laura or Derry or somebody, if you can answer that question. Laura, would you like to talk about some of the changes we've made recently to, um, in our hiring practices to have a diverse panel? I'm having trouble hearing Clifford, you're, I think you were muted. I didn't know if you wanted me to take the question. I yeah. didn't. I didn't hear the question clearly either. Laura, the the, the question was question. about um, who does the hiring here at East Bay Mud, and um, I thought you seem to be muted right now. The question that was asked was, do we have data on who does the hiring at East Bay? Um, so the example given was, are people of color involved in the hiring process? So, so yes, we, the, we have that data. 
we, we make sure that all of our hiring um, interview panels have, are um, diverse in both race and gender. And we do have the data. I just want to test, can, can everyone hear me? Now I can okay. hear you. No. Thank you. All right, um, thank you for that. The next question we had was, did we speak with retirees? And if not, will we? Um, we did not speak with those who retired from the organization, but we would perhaps suggest that as a next step or possibly something you would want to involve or incorporate in your own racial equity strategy. All right, so now I'm just gonna go over questions by each section of the audit. So first the HR data, some people had some Tamara, questions and clear. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Before we go forward, um, you know, what what we will be doing in uh, in case of that specific thing with, with retirees, um, part we will be integrating kind of that discussion into our strategy long-term. Um, one of the things that is already in place is um, a, a strong relationship with our retirees overall. So we will, we believe we'll have a good opportunity to uh, engage them in further discussion. Great. Awesome to hear. Um, all right. So with HR data, a few of you asked to clarify the terms on voluntary and involuntary termination and what is included in discharged um, employees. So these are actually internal terms used by East Bay. Um, discharged in the context of East Bay is being terminated before the end of a contract and release is contract ends, so employment ends. So discharge would be considered involuntary. Voluntary um, includes retirement, which is one of the questions as well. Um, and these are also explained a bit in the appendix of the report as well. In terms of breakdown of data, someone just shared the statement breakdown of data for people of color. So the HR data is break, broken down by people of color and white employees. Um, and there's graphs for each of the promotions to, or terminations and hiring. This is in the report in Appendix D on page 125 for um, greater reference. Just for the sake of time, I don't wanna go into those in detail, but that is available to you. Someone did share if there was a breakdown by gender for black and African-American employees. We didn't have a breakdown by gender of black and African-American employees specifically because that sample size was very small, but we do have the breakdowns in the appendix again, page 25, 125 is appendix D, which is where this starts. Um, we have it breaking down by people of color and gender. So white people of color, um, males and females. And the key findings to this are also in the slide deck on slide 12. So I hope that is helpful for you all if you want to um, look that up or use it for your strategic work. Um, and lastly, the two, last two questions about HR data were how should the board interpret the data? Are the numbers good or bad? Um, and also including data on overall breakdown by race, gender for district employees. Again, this information of the overall EB MUD demographics is also in the appendix page 125. In terms of are these numbers good or bad? This is a really good question. A lot of people often ask us, what does this mean? How are we compared to other organizations? What we like to say in terms of our cultural audit process is this is the start of you looking at how you can compare yourself to your organization. Historically, no matter what utility company you look at across the industry, there is work to be done in terms of systemic inequities regarding race, gender, sexual orientation. So in terms of these numbers being good or bad, we don't like to put this into binaries, but rather that this is an opportunity to grow, to improve. Um, I would say overall, if Mary Frances, do you have any insight on this in terms of the industry? But I would say um, that's why kind of we don't say this is good or bad. So compare, comparing, comparing yourself to your industry, um, just to be really honest, I've been doing this work for 37 years. And so just to be really honest, um, your, your industry 
has in general not done well in diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And so to compare yourself to organizations that historically have not done well, um, I don't believe is helpful. I think that you should set your own goal. Where do you want to be? How do you want to be known? And then benchmark against whatever that um, goal um, is um, uh, for yourself. And you're not the only industry that hasn't done well in this in this regard, but you are one that has not necessarily um, you know, done, done well. The stories that I heard this morning, uh, I heard 25 years ago uh, in working with um, uh, organizations in, in your industry. Thank you for that. Um, so does anyone have any other questions regarding HR data before I move to the focus group questions? Um, did, did we notice any um, uh, particular differences or uh, you know, locuses of the problem? Is the problem worse in certain departments or units? Uh, did we get any data that would indicate uh, some, some targeting um, appropriateness within the organization? That's a good question. We actually did not um, disaggregate our data by business unit. However, um, overall, there was just significant differences across racial disparities and gender disparities, um, especially for women and for people of color. Um, but other than that, we don't have that information um, in our report. <clears throat> Anyone else? I don't know if the data set, I don't know how large the data set is. And Derry, I don't know if that's something that you all would want to, would want to do. Uh, because it is helpful. Um, thank you, um, Andy, for that uh, question, because it often is helpful to hold uh, leaders accountable uh, in the various um, organizational units. Yes, thank you, Mary Francis. One of the things that we, we are in and going to be integrating into our strategic plan is um, some specific metrics that we want to monitor. And so part of those metrics will be looking, um, um, well, one of the things that we did with our affirmative action report this year was uh, began breaking more data out by by department that we're in the process of, of giving to uh, um, um, uh, managers of departments right now. And again, going forward, part of the part of that work will be again having some set metrics that we keep as a dashboard that we're going on, on maintaining on a regular basis, as opposed to just our annual reports for affirmative action. I'll just quickly add to. I mean, part of the strategic plan, we're going to integrate um, the work that we looked at in the women in trade. So we do know that that's an issue, um, as well as veterans um, and other groups as well. So some of um, these other reports that we've worked on is going to be integrated within the strategic plan. So um, that's really just to support Darius' point. All right, so with focus group data, we just had one or two quick questions. And I think some of this was clarified with Derry's presentation prior to this, but the cultural audit, someone asked the cultural audit does not include focus groups for LGBTQIA plus communities. And there was the minimal participation from Asian folks and white males. How should this data be interpreted given low participation from those groups? This is a really good question and to be clear, I did want to emphasize that even though we didn't have a specific LGBTQIA plus focus group, um, that wasn't part of when we were working with East Bay, um, the conversation of having a specific group to them. They, there may be, or may have been participation if they were still, if folks who identify as LGBTQIA were selected for one of the other groups based off of their other identities. For example, someone who identifies as LGBTQIA um, may have been in the white women group if that was something they were selected for. So based on the low participation, so oftentimes we run into low participation due to various things such as internal culture at the organization as well as cultural differences. For example, we see Hispanic, Latinx folks as well as Asian um, folks sometimes not wanting to participate because of a reverence or respect to one's job, to one's organization, and not wanting to share anything malignant um, that would put them or their organization um, in danger. So that's sometimes a cultural reason that people don't choose to participate. We did get some participation from these groups and a reason to take them and to still take this um, data that we've presented as valid is because we do use random sampling. So even though we had a small 
percentage of white males participate, even though the majority of East Bay is white males, we were able to get a random sample and this helps us better mitigate um, any biases in the data. So we can still use this to make some broad assumptions with the understanding that there are limitations because of the small. Uh, seems like a small N yes. to be saying that it's statistically significant that it's random. I mean, it, uh, it, it I, doesn't I really. It was, so I didn't say it was statistically significant. I'm saying it's statistically reliable because it is a random sample. Qualitative data can't be statistically significant, but what we can use is it's an opportunity to be able to highlight experiences and provide context to quantitative data we see. So for example, we were able to get some broad patterns on how various white males at the organization responded to diversity, equity, and inclusion. That doesn't mean that that's the sum of everyone's lived experience as a white male at East Bay, but we can still use that information broadly when we're thinking about creating our strategies. Um, the ends are small, um, but that is, again, I think as Derry said, an opportunity to do more focus groups, perhaps especially with LGBTQ community um, and get some more ongoing data and perhaps changing the way that focus groups and um, data is collected over time at East Bay. And in and, and, and regards to that, our we have held uh, two focus groups uh, in partnership with our reigning pride uh, affinity group. Uh, we've uh, held two focus groups with the LGBTQIA plus uh, uh, community. We also have already scheduled um, uh, focus groups for uh, both white males and Asian males. So that supplemental data will be, uh, be collected uh, during the month of July. And we will have those available when we uh, when we have the full strategic plan prepared. That data will be integrated into the full strategic plan in terms of how that fits in with the rest of the data that we've uh, received from Winters. Awesome. Um, and the last question regarding focus groups are: How can, as Jerry said, any supplemental data be collected, be integrated? It is all up to you all. So I think Derry and the greater team with the collaboration of ONG and the Winters Group will make sure to incorporate any of this additional focus group work or additional data that you all have collected. All right, so any questions regarding focus groups, I can move on to the inclusion insights questions and then overall questions about recommendations. Awesome. All right, so the only question we had about the Inclusion Insights Survey was, are the perceptions of employees a, um, a, a, a generational issue or a tenor, tenure issue? So this question was relating to the um, findings that we saw that millennials had a more favorable perception of the climate at EB Mud as well as um, by tenure, those with zero to five years of tenure also had a more favorable perception. So I would say it's not an either or here, it would be a combination of both. There were some significant differences in the data across both generation and tenure. If we wanna look at this and take a closer look at the retention, we also see in the generation data and the HR data that millennials were more likely to receive promotions and Gen X um, employees were more likely to lead the organization. So that could also be a factor perhaps how promotions are um, given to those of lower tenure or of the millennial generation. Both of these things should be taken into consideration together. So our short answer to that is it's an, a factor of both tenure and generation. So we'd wanna look closer at retention, um, which I know is part of what you all are looking at in your strategic plan as well. And I would just like to add to that, that um, oftentimes uh, tenure and generation are highly correlated. You know, the younger you are, chances are you haven't had that much tenure. The older you are, you've had more tenure. So there's high correlation there. I've got a question. So as you're dealing with tenure and, and age and all of that stuff, one of the things that's an, always an ongoing problem is you've got folks thinking, well, what difference does age make? I should get promoted regardless. 
And you got folks that are saying, hey, I put in my dues, I get to go for the next spot up. How do you reconcile that within your data? You're talking about, I'm sorry, Frank, you're talking about, um, you're talking about seniority, I guess, right? Tenure, seniority, whatever you want to call it. And the question is, how do we reconcile that within our data? Yeah, I mean, you're going to have people that are saying, well, you got all these uh, folks of one ethnic group or another, and because they've been here so long, they keep us other folks out of the, out of the uh, mix. And yet, the collective bargaining agreement looks to having consideration for the seniority and uh, folks who have seniority look to having the consideration of their time but yet the the mix of people doesn't lend itself to being able to reconcile those two how does your data look at people of seniority who are tenure being chiefly one economic, uh, one uh, ethnic group or another, with those who are the newcomers who are more mixed group, feeling like they're being left out when the collective bargaining agreement, the civil service system seems to lock that in. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I don't have an answer to that because we, you know, the, the civil service is what it is. It's government, it's, it's legislated, I mean, it's mandated. And so you all have to find some creative ways um, to develop people and to provide people with opportunities, um, you know, for, for growth. Um, the fact that, um, you know, here we are in 2000 and 2021, and we're still saying that people of color don't have seniority. Um, we were saying that 37 years ago when I first started this business. Right. And so there's something happening in the system where people of color are not getting the seniority. By this time, you should have some folks who have seniority. So I think this is what you're examining and this is what you're exploring. So I don't think, you know, we, we obviously, you're not going to change the civil service system. To, uh, hof hopefully it will change over time, but you're not going to change it, um, uh, you know, right, right now. Um, but when you look at, um, you know, who's most impacted by these policies and, and, and uh, laws and whatnot, that's, that's how to get at systemic racism, right? And it's a long, you know, it's, a, it's more complex, obviously, than, than, you know, what we're able to do in the data. We, we find it out. We, we discover it. We, we open it up. You heard today people who were talking about their, you know, their, their lived experiences as well. But when we get at the system stuff, I mean, that's really, I think you're bringing up a really great point, Frank. It's, it, that's the system. And we've got to change the systems. And that's a bigger discussion. And, the, and I would point out that in that issue of changing the system, any number of times over the years, because I've dealt with both public and private sector, in the public sector, raising the issue of using uh, either seniority or merit system immediately draws a crisis with the labor unions. Because you know, on, on one hand, they have the opportunity to sit there and say, there are all these things wrong with the system, but don't change it because we have to protect our senior members. And I have a difficulty trying to figure out how to do that. In the private sector, we've been able to approach that just fine. We say, we're going to do certain things. Now, I'm speaking from my own experience as a uh, negotiator representing employers, We've done that, but in the public, we run right up against that civil service wall and we run right up against the unions being somewhat duplicitous, uh, not somewhat, being duplicitous. And, you know, I'm looking for your report from you guys, a, a way for us to find our way through the uh, labyrinth. And I'm hoping that part of what you're going to be saying to us is say, well, here's a way, because if all you're going to do is say, here's the problem, good luck, guys. Then no, we, made, we made a number of recommendations. We did not say good luck, guys. We made a number of recommendations within the confines of the recommendations that we could make. But I want to turn this back over to Derry and to Clifford, uh, because you, know, you all are dealing with this on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think um, you are coming up with some creative ways to um, address this issue. I'll, I'll take a first shot at this and Derry can jump in, but I think what you saw in Derry's presentation 
and the things that we're working on. You know, first, you know, among the four items that you talked about, one of them is to look at the civil service rules, the rules themselves and how we implement the rules. And then two of the five pilot um, projects that we're talking about is on, you know, a promotion and retention and hiring and recruitment. Um, you know, those were identified uh, as issues. And I think uh, Director Mellon, you know, you know, both directly and di indirectly related to the question that you're talking about um, and that you're asking of, you know, how do we work around these issues? Um, and we had that discussion fairly recently. recently. Um, Derry can talk about those pilot teams um, and the discussion on, you know, how do we deal with both the hiring and retention, uh, promotion and retention, hiring and recruitment. Yes, and, and and I think there's there's again with, within those groups. I mean, part of their dis, part of their discussions have been centered around um, uh, identifying who the most impacted groups are, and and how can we have more dialogue specifically with those who who have been in situations feeling like they've either been passed over or or they haven't progressed, and and to really get some data in terms of, of what what are the causes behind it, because. There's there there's kind of t multiple layers of this, and, and one is the competitive layer, in terms of someone uh, being in position, um, and and in a position being open to the public, um, having good skills, but then again, uh, being in competition with people who who are either outranking them or or or, or, or have other skill sets that they're bringing to the table. So that again brings us to the question about how do we continue to do internal development with people. And one of the things that we we have had over time has been our academies internally, specifically um, uh, to help people cultivate those skills, our managers and supervisors training. Uh, but those don't extend fully into, uh, again, people who may be in 2019. Um, and again, part of it is a bandwidth issue. Another is just kind of uh, figuring out how do we how do we become more creative in doing that. And, and part of the creativity in doing that has been doing things like our pilot with uh, Peralta uh, for our cohort program in terms of how do we continue to get those educational requirements and educational skill sets and skills that, that, that are around public speaking or other things that are, are, are professional development opportunities for people. So it is, it, is, it is about, again, the creativity which we use in order to kind of, again, build our own internal bench strength and to continue to help those individuals be competitive um, through the civil service process as we go forward. Um, but then again, then again, there's also the evaluation of the process itself, and I think we're we're trying to look at this from from kind of both the the, the personal level of personal development, but then also at the structural level, and and how do we how do we address the structures that are currently in the systems to make sure that we're we're uh, we're creating the best opportunity for people to actually be able to showcase their abilities or their skill sets uh, when they're in the evaluation process. We have no, one. Jerry, there was the consent agreement, and I had the opportunity to be an employee at the time of the consent agreement. And it seemed to me that that consent agreement provided more opportunities to provide for a better mix of folks than what we had once we came off the consent agreement. And that may be heresy for some folks, but is that what it's going to take for us to get there, enter into a new consent agreement? Because I see the civil service rules as an impediment. And I also see the collective bargaining agreements. And so I'm going to go for one more level of heresy. And that is, and Marguerite, forgive me for what I'm about to say, but one of the things I always admired about my SEIU agreements in the healthcare sector was the range of people that could move from someone could start out as a nurse's aide and eventually work their way up into uh, uh, LVM. And our only problem was the nurses union didn't want anything to do with the LVNs and we had to negotiate something special there. But maybe we need to merge 444 and 2019 in order to be able to create these range of movements because there is historical cases. One is the most famous involving the Teamsters Union of a, of a company that had local pickup and delivery and long haul employees. And local pickup and delivery people had no bidding rights to the long haul. And the court said, yep, that's appropriate because it's a collective bargaining agreement for each unit. And so maybe that's what we ought to consider throwing at the unions in order to get ourselves into a better position of having mobility upward and across lines. Uh, I'm sorry, I 
got off on a theme that maybe I shouldn't have. And Pre Margarita, I hope I caused On a me. tangent. Okay. President Lenny, we have I, two. I, I'll reserve comment for offline on the first question. Um, and, uh, you know, on the second one, I, uh, clearly, I think that's up to the union. <laughs> that's a union uh, governance question um, coming from a union that does consolidations often. Um, <laughs> the thorny issue, at, at the least. Indeed. President Lenny, we have two uh, members of the public with their hands raised for comment. Did you want to take those now? Um, sure, we want to dialogue. All right, we have three now. I have three hands. So first, Max Fifer, you should be able to unmute your mic and your three minutes start now. All right, can you hear me fine? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great, thank you. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Max Pfeffer and I'm the vice president of the reigning Pride Affinity Group. I have the pleasure of presenting to you at the previous two board meetings in support of Pride Month, our new Pride flag for the district and for the resolution passed one week ago in support of the LGBTQIA plus community. I'm, on I'm here today on behalf of our Affinity Group to Pride comment on the Winters Group Report. The Winters Group Report and presentation in April, 2021 presented a wrong and harmful assumptions about the LGBTQIA plus community. First, the Winters group presented gender as a binary, male and female. Reigning Pride objects to this wrong and harmful assumption in a report that's even entitled Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at East Bay Mud. Excuse me. Second, with regard to sexual orientation, the Winters group again makes a wrong and harmful assumption by presenting data as heterosexual versus LGB that's assuming lesbian, gay, and bisexual. This assumption erases the marginalized experiences of transgender, intersex, asexual, queer, and other marginalized identities that are not captured under heterosexual versus LGB. Reigning Pride has raised these concerns to district staff, including the senior management team and the employee development team since the Winters Group presented in April. So that's over two months ago. In the spirit of the resolution, it in support of our community passed by this board just one week ago, I encourage the board to keep these harmful assumptions in mind when you're considering the Winters Group report and consider asking the Winters Group to acknowledge these harmful assumptions in their final report. Thank you very much. Um, Max, can I ask, a, uh, Doug, can I ask Max a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so Max, what would you um, uh, correct um, you know, in in the data, would you not report um, experiences of um, women, or or do you want, or as a, you know, women and men, or would sure. you simply, um, you know, put a, a you know a qualifier cisgendered women? I mean, I don't think that people were identified. Um, along the people identified themselves along the spectrum in the data gathering, I'm guessing, I'm assuming actually. Um, so I, just what would you, if, if it could be, if it could reflect what you'd like to see it reflect, what would it look like? Sure, so I think there are a couple options we could do. I think the, the first thing we can do is just acknowledge this in the report that we weren't planning on providing public comment today until it wasn't brought up today, but we thought it's important that this needs to be just stated that this data was collected. It was only collected in a binary. Staff only had the option to choose male or female. That that should just be in, in at least in our in inclusion survey we were gathered. So I think it's important just to acknowledge that, um, just to say we are lacking this data or we didn't represent this properly when we collected the data. And that's, I think, the base level we could do. Um, and then just going forward, as we're looking at our strategic plan, we look at more inclusive ways to gather data. Okay. Um, I, I saw somebody from Winter. I saw Marisha group shaking, shaking head. their head. Yeah. Maybe you, you have a comment. response, Marisha? Yeah, I'm trying to pull up the survey, but we definitely did ask um, beyond um, men and women in the survey. So I'm not sure if he's. If Max, are you referring to the survey analysis or somewhere 
different because the HR data, we did not have LGBTQ data to um, analyze. So we only had men. Right, right, right. So and which one are you referring problem, to? Though. Plus right, so that's a problem with, with how data is collected with, within the district, which would be obviously a recommendation that we would add to, um, you know, going forward. But so we analyzed the data that we were able to, to that we had access to. And one of our recommendations for the district, and thank you so much for sharing, Max. Absolutely, this is a limitation, not just for you all, but a lot of organizations don't collect um, accurate or multidimensional data on gender, sex, sexuality. Um, and we, from our perspective, we try to make sure to use that as much as possible. And we're not trying to defend ourselves for not including this data here, but we were just not given the data that you are describing. However, in the Inclusion Insights Survey, there are options for um, prefer or choosing not to answer as well as um, I think Marisha is looking up which groups we did. And that was also up to the district to decide which demographic groups to choose. We did share, um, we did share in our recommendations and we'll continue to share as you were saying, how to improve the data collection process within East Bay um, is something that'll be incredibly important, especially including um, various dimensions of sexuality and um, beyond the binary or traditional binary connotation. So we definitely hear you there. In terms of the report itself, it is at a complete phase with the data we were given. However, we can share that that is a limitation. We weren't told, um, we weren't, we did not at the time of when we were doing focus groups collect LGBTQ specific data, which we now recognize after the fact. Um, and I think these are all just really great recommendations and things to move forward with. And as we see um, that there was clearly folks who weren't represented. Um, but in terms of how people identified in the in survey, we cannot identify themselves. It was self-identified. So that is a limitation as well. There may be folks who did take the survey who do not choose to answer their gender um, or gender orientations. And we do take that in, into account um, in our analyses, but we didn't find any um, significant differences or patterns in that regard. We did find interesting though, that I do wanna mention is um, as a person who was overseeing a lot of this analysis, very little came up about the LGBT community as a whole in the focus groups when we asked the questions. Um, I thought that was interesting and says a lot about the internal culture um, of trust and communication. So definitely, as you're saying, um, this is an area of opportunity and something we'll, we will seriously consider in our strategy planning session um, and also make sure to emphasize throughout the rest of this process with East Bay. Uh, Tamara, you, you said it didn't come up and you said that that was an important insight, but I'm not clear from you on whether that's a positive or I mean, whether that's a comment on, I mean, given, given that this topic is one that is historically people hide, do not disclose, um, et cetera, that it didn't come up doesn't mean, I mean, if you're saying that that's a good thing because it means that people don't have issues um, I, I don't think you can infer that from a lack of. No, yeah, thanks for, thanks for that, Marie. I want to clarify it. I don't think that's a good thing per se. I don't think that's a bad thing per se. We didn't ask specific questions to have that be brought up either. And um, I do think given you do have a large resource group with LGBTQ folks, um, perhaps those experiences weren't being shared for one reason or another. Um, and we don't have the answers to why, but that's something we'll need to further explore. When I say it's interesting, I thought in the context of this being such an issue that has been brought up post the audit report, um, usually we would include any findings about um, in the qualitative data in regards to this community or any marginalized communities that come up. And it didn't when looking back at the data to see if we were missing anything about the LGBTQ community. President Lenny, we have one more um, person on the line for public comment. 
Let's go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Max. Eric, you should be able to unmute your mic. And your three minutes Thank will you. start now. Thank you, Risha. This is Eric Larson, President of AFSCME Local 444. I just wanted to provide for the record that um, per AFSCME Local 444 Memorandum of Understanding and the Civil Service Rules, the only uh, benefits of uh, seniority that are provided by our uh, MOU or Civil Service Rules language is uh, vacation preference and uh, shift bidding and continuous operations. Uh, there is no uh, merit uh, given or credit given for a seniority uh, based on uh, or promotional promotional opportunities based on seniority. Uh, promotions uh, have uh, nothing to do with uh, seniority uh, status. Uh, similarly, I could uh, promote to uh, uh, positions represented by uh, 2019, for instance, construction inspector. Uh, or into uh, IFTPE Local uh, 21, if I should uh, uh, apply for a promotional opportunity. Uh, the best opportunity that uh, East Bay Mud has to reduce uh, barriers of entry for underserved or underrepresented uh, members of our community are to continue to uh, uh, build apprenticeship programs and internship opportunities and return to hiring at the entry level, uh, especially in the trades, uh, move away from only hiring journey level uh, uh, status uh, trades workers and return to uh, hiring uh, at the entry level in the trades. Uh, so thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, um, I'd like to do just a quick time check on, on where we are in the program. We don't want to stifle any conversation here, but uh, we'll also be appreciative of everyone's time. So we, um, I think the last item besides uh, what, what uh, FAMRO has co covered so far is the actual policies and procedures that were reviewed. So I think those are the last things. I think there may be one, one more question. Um, but beyond that, the only other thing we were going to do is have a little, uh, little deeper discussion about the uh, pivot that we're doing and, and the uh, work that will happen with that. Derry, I just wanted to go back to Max's question about what was asked in the survey and just to give you all some more insight. So we have two questions in there. One is how do you identify your gender where they can select multiple choices, which is man, woman, non-binary, tran transgender, and then I prefer not to answer. And then we also have the sexual orientation question. So we only had, you know, three people identify as non-binary. One is transgender and 122 prefer not to answer. So when we do the, you know, that's not enough people to give data on. So that's why you, when you see the man and woman, it's because we only had four people that identified outside of that. So I just wanted to clarify that we definitely asked the question, but we can only um, report on how people respond, right, and what they feel comfortable. And so, you know, people may just not have felt comfortable sharing because there may be, you know, thinking, oh, this might get back to somewhere that I don't want it to get back to. So I just wanted to, to put that on the record and just to share um, that that's why it may seem like that. And we could definitely have been more clear in the, in the report as to why, you know, that, that was missing. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Marisha. I, I, I wanted to quickly uh, come come back to the point that um, uh, Frank had raised, but uh, but I think of it uh, more more specifically as a um, a pipeline of our supervisors and our managers. So when we're when we're looking at um, who we're hiring into uh, uh, that uh, portion of our pipeline, um, how how are we able to uh, uh, Build uh, equity uh, and and diversity as we uh, continue to hire at that uh, portion of the pipeline. So that, that's another way of phrasing or framing the question, um, uh, not to the exclusion of what Frank was raising, but that I think that's that's what's um, 
uh, one one aspect that's that's very important. Um, I recall also that we've heard um, it's very it's very helpful to hear from uh, local 444 on um, uh, approaches to uh, human resources and the emphasis of uh, what portion of the pipeline that we we might uh, uh, refocus on, um, not specifically for um, uh, diversity and inclusion, um, but uh, but for many benefits beyond diversity and inclusion. Um, at least I, I didn't hear a specific rationale, um, but I, I, I can understand uh, multiple rationales, including diversity and inclusion uh, for uh, expanding hiring at the entry level within the local 444 jurisdiction. Um, I also recall that we have heard uh, uh, very frequently from uh, local 2019 over the years, um, not as much recently, but, but, uh, but over the years, we've heard a lot uh, about internal promotion. And I, I, in my um, understanding that that has been um, uh, 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 accepted as something that is, is viewed as a good thing. Um, and and I, I do believe that it, in the absence of um, inequitable outcomes that it would be viewed as a good thing um, to, to, be, to be able to have uh, strong staff morale, to be able to continue a career at the district and to look forward to a, a career that has opportunities for advancement. That is a good thing. Um, but I think we, we do need to pay close attention to uh, inequities throughout the promotion pipeline uh, and, and to uh, be able to have interventions that, that address it and, and to try to reconcile these, these uh, both important values. Thank you for that, Andy. I just, we just had one more question that someone had asked um, that I did wanna address and Mary Francis, feel free to chime in as well, Marisha as well and Ariel. But someone asked, what can the board do to support this effort? Um, huge question, and I think there's a lot of pieces to it, but I did want to mention that one of the things we've noticed over time is what's really important for this diversity, equity, inclusion work, and specifically racial equity work to be effective um, and impactful at your organization. It needs to not be segmented or siloed across the organization. So oftentimes we're seeing perhaps the board has initiatives, the staff has initiatives. How can we meld these strategies together and make sure as a board that we are aligned with what is going on with the staff and looking at this as beyond a HR or talent acquisition issue. Yes, that's important and we did see that in the data, but also what are some other ways the board can make sure to embed diversity, equity, inclusion, even your conversation about policies and the civil service rules, which we're going to be looking into more is a great start to that, but also looking at how can we better support and listen to staff at the organization who, as we see today, are clearly experiencing really traumatic um, and unjust experiences. So making sure to be on a um, united front as in being aligned with why this is important and making sure to, as the board, communicate clearly um, and create channels with the staff to merge and create a unified diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. When it's siloed, then we're ending up being inefficient, we're leading to miscommunications, and perhaps not having the most robust or impactful strategy. So that is our recommendation to you all. And if Mary Frances, do you have anything else to add? Thanks, Damra. Um, so I think, you know, doing what you're doing um, shows a very engaged board. I, I've worked with boards for years and talk about the difference between a committed board and an engaged board. So a committed uh, board was one that, um, you know, that's committed and they sign things and they speak and, and they, you know, um, they, they say that they're committed um, and they show it by uh, approving, you know, different initiatives. But an engaged board um, is one that really is very involved in and is a part of uh, the uh, actual process and the strategy. And um, based on your interest and based on what you've been doing the, these last few meetings, I would say that you are definitely an engaged board. So continue to do what you're doing. Some boards, and I, and I don't know the structure of your board, so excuse me, now some boards do have a, spe a, a specific committee that um, is just to monitor and to advise on the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, 
So I think you're doing, I think you're, I think you're off to a good start. Yeah, I would say that we've, we've uh, definitely committed to do this uh, as a uh, board at large rather than a committee that way for, for that very purpose. Yeah, we have about five more minutes. And so I, I wanted to just ask for, from the board, were there any specific questions uh, about the approaches to the recommendations that Winters made? Um, I, I, um, I, I think it would be good to um, uh, address Max's um, comments in some, you know, um, way. I also have, in this, I don't think this relates necessarily to the Winters group um, as much as to the next steps on the strategic plan and pilot projects is whether as part of um, our hiring and promotion as part of the um, workplace culture change and I'm not sure which initiative it best fits in, but I'm wondering, uh, you talked about alternative dispute resolution, but I, I haven't heard yet um, uh, how we might incorporate uh, a restorative justice framework into um, resolving some of these issues. Because what, what we heard this morning are both things that are happening now, but also things that are festering unresolved um, or feel to be unresolved issues um, that we, you know, kind of recognize have a formal resolution process through an EEOC complaint, which automatically uh, or oftentimes, I should say, um, does the opposite of what we would want it to do in terms of heal, um, incorporating the, you know, the, the learnings from the experience um, in a way that, that build or move towards justice. They, I mean, part of, part of the EEOC process just sort of institutionalizes uh, um, the problem in, in a lot of ways. So um, any, I, I don't know, Derry, if you thought about or looked at um, how to involve, include restorative justice practices or uh, processes within our. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, I'm done. No, uh, uh, not specifically re restorative justice, but part of our part of our evaluation and, and look at how we're handling all of the and and again. Uh, um, one individual mentioned this. I think it was uh, Thomas mentioned um, that you know, in in a case not in in DIO not rising to the level of a full investigation, what happens after that, and and how do we actually do some 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 mitigation of the problems? Because what happens is if we don't address it, then we 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 will inherit a problem later on, and it doesn't it doesn't do well for the for the organizational culture. So um, I think we can look further into restorative justice practices and, and how those could be integrated as a front end uh, to, uh, to uh, investigations, especially in cases where, where, where we haven't had the, the full experience of, of, of someone uh, being a, uh, affected by something that fits into a traditional EEO category, but we still have a problem. So, so that's something we can definitely look forward to in terms of how we build that into the strategic process. And the secondary thing in terms of, of one of the things in within Max com, Max's comments is that uh, we, we have received and will be will, will be integrated into the strategic plan is the um, Rainy Pride has uh, provided for us uh, a series of recommendations that, that are part of their gender gender identity initiative. So those those specific things that they have identified are things that we will be integrating into the strategic plan and looking at overall. So so we are in communication with them in terms of 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 how we get to that point and make sure that those concerns are addressed. All right, Lisa, your hand is up. Yes. Um, you know, when I was elected to this board over 20 years ago, we had high level African-American um, managers in place. 
once they retired, they were obviously replaced by others, um, which leads me to really our impediments here. And yeah, civil service is an impediment, but also Prop 209 um, is an impediment. And I don't know how we get around that, but I would like to see some suggestions um, going forward. You know, Prop 209 has just blocked us from doing so many things over the years. And uh, no one, has found any creative ways to deal with Prop 209. So I'm looking forward to that. And, and I have to say again, African-Americans specifically and particularly feel isolated and unappreciated at East Bay Mud. And it's something that we have to take a look at. Not only that, but also your data shows that white men employees really overall don't feel there's a problem. Um, and they are in fact, the ones doing the hiring predominantly. That's also an issue. Um, they either feel there's not a problem or they're uninterested in the problem. And we've got to get to everyone at the top, those who are in fact during the hiring. I heard Laura say earlier, you know, there are all these people of color uh, in the hiring process, but do they really feel they can speak up? Um, do they really feel that their voice can be heard um, in that process? And I don't believe so. Um, and that's actually another impediment. So yeah, we've got work to do, but I think we are committed and engaged. And um, I know it's going to take time you know, this didn't develop overnight. So uh, it is a process. And I hope we're all willing to actually take a good look at ourselves as well uh, in this process of uh, going forward. So I thank the winners group for um, everything you're doing. And I look forward to getting even more in-depth information about, um, and I guess, um, Mary Francis, you talked about minimalization earlier. Um, and I think that's what our white males are doing. They minimize the problem or just don't believe it exists. So going forward, we've got to get um, not only African-Americans, but I'm speaking specifically about African-Americans in positions um, of authority and influence within the district like we had 20 years ago before Prop 209. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I see your hand. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, I, I think as a side piece of information, directing this towards you, Clifford and Laura Acosta, um, the hiring committees, which are really a key part of what gets somebody started. I mean, we have our civil service process, people have to fill out the application, they have to have the, the skills checklist and so forth. But um, my, my perception, but I don't know that it's right, or that it's accurate, uh, is that the hiring committees tend to have a good mix to them but I sure would like to see what some of our data has on that because, uh, you know, we bring people in from different agencies and, and as well as one of our own. I'm sure Mary Francis that you saw that when you were looking at what we do for hiring. Um, and so I'm gonna throw a curveball at you for a moment if I might. When you were looking at your data and doing your interviewing, did you get any perception about the hiring committees? Um, no, I'm going to share, share that, that data. Go ahead. Sorry. I can I can share that with you in the <laughs> interviews and focus groups. Um, hiring committees rarely came up. I think a few of the stakeholders shared it as a recommendation to reevaluate them, but we didn't really get any um, data or conversation about them other than that. Because I, I think I think the groups that we were interviewing perhaps might not have even been 
um, knowledgeable about them. Is, would that be a fair statement? Well, let's Perhaps. ask Laura. She's right here. Yeah, and we just, remember, we just started um, requiring uh, diversity on the hiring panels not too long ago. I think um, maybe within the last two years. And before that, it, it was more um, choose your panel. And so we instituted that change about two years ago. So we, we might have, uh, you know, a little bit of data to share with you, but the, the recruitment team um, actually double checks the hiring panels, the people they're selecting, the hiring managers are selecting for the hiring panels and making sure that it's both diverse um, in, in um, race and gender. So uh, the district hasn't had that policy in place for very long maybe a year and maybe two years. Um, but we can gather some of that data to show you if you like. And I would suggest, Laura, again, if you look at the consent agreement, I think there was, my recollection is bad on this. I think there was something in there uh, before the consent agreement was finally lifted and it was in place for like, 20 years. Um, there might've been something in there about that as well. Maybe you can dig that out for uh, information too. Okay. Any other questions, comments by board members? <clears throat> All right, Gary, do you have any? Uh, excuse me. Yeah, no, no questions from me. Uh, just in, in summary, again, one of the things that we'll be working forward, working with uh, both ONG Racial Equity and the Winters Group in, is the continuation of our pilot projects, which we'll be addressing many of the things that were talked about today, and then also the the work specifically on the development of the strategic plan. So again, a lot of the data points that we talked about today, um, a lot of the specifics that uh, we heard people talking about are things that will be addressed. And, and again, we're, we're looking forward to continuing to, to move all of this forward. And, and thank I'll, you all for having us today. I'll just add that um, I want to thank the board for, again, for your commitment and engagement in this whole process. I want to thank all the people who spoke today and all the people who have spoken to us that um, didn't feel comfortable or didn't address the board today. Um, we've received lots of feedback from others outside of the board meeting. And all those comments are appreciated and are, are being considered in our plans. Actually, just yeah. one question, Clifford. I'm wondering, I mean, in um, an EIR, which this isn't, obviously, there's a requirement to um, provide the comments as part of the record. Um, can we... Um, I mean, it may be that people don't want to have their identity, you know, just some way to for us to, as a board, to be able to review all the comments that have been received, not just the ones we hear in, in um, this forum. We can see how, how best to capture that and share it with the board, since some of the comments do contain confidential information. Yeah, so maybe, I mean, uh, to the extent that it's possible to do. Okay, we'll, we'll have a discussion and see how best to do that. I think, Marguerite, uh, that they could uh, redact the names, but include the information, the questions. And part of the redacting would also be not to identify what work unit the question came from. Yeah, redacting, potentially identifying information, dates, places, you know, uh, work unit, name, et cetera. Date of interview would probably be okay, but you're right about work unit and uh, I'm agreeing with you. Uh, but but I, I I do think it's important to, uh, you know, get a handle on what, you know, what are some of the root causes and possible interventions regarding harassment and um, uh, have, having a uh, inclusive employee culture uh, at the district. Um, I, I view our comments about hiring uh, equity and diversity 
uh, as as part of the, uh, you know, that, that that bigger task of having um, an inclusive culture. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, uh, interesting and important discussion. Uh, and uh, if there are no other items to be considered, uh, we'll say that the next regular meeting of the board will be held on Tuesday, July 13th at 1.15. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.